We're starting today with Terence Deacon, the Symbolic Species. Uh, this text happens to be long and somewhat difficult, so hopefully the lectures will clear up some of the questions you'll have. I'm going to start uh, with Deacon's beginning question, and he asks this question. He says that he, in his book, that he runs into this question uh, when he goes to visit this uh, class of school children. Um, he um, is still working uh, at UC Berkeley right now um, and wrote uh, published Sym Symbolic Species in 1997 um, and I think that this since then this is really one of the the main books to, to look to on discussions of the origin of language. He also published his other book in 2011, uh, Incomplete Nature, uh, that talks about the emergence of mind from matter and sort of the, the, the difference between mind and matter. The symbolic species, as I said, begins with this anecdote he has of visiting this class of school children. And the school children, one of the children asks why animals can't speak. And uh, he, uh, and, and and he says, well, um, he didn't really have a proper answer for that question. And, and because of this experience, he decided starting to start this research and figuring out, well, why is it that animals can't even have a simple language, right? So the question is, is in a sense, well, even if humans have this complicated grammatical structure and a very complicated language with universal grammar, wouldn't it be possible, shouldn't it be possible, for animals to have a simple version of language that might not be as complex, that might just have fewer numbers of symbols and fewer rules. And he indicates that there are no such simple languages out, out, you know, outside of humans, that animals don't in fact possess any such simple languages. And he undertakes in the beginning to try and explain why no such simple languages might exist. And he begins then with Peirce's categories. You recall likeness, index, and symbol. And he tries to work out exactly what it is that animals are doing when they're using their forms of languages. And as we've already indicated in the course, there are forms of representation that occur in the animal world as either likenesses that, we've, that, that he calls icons or as indices. And he gives an example that we've referred to in the past, but he des describes this example in detail of vervet monkeys. Now vervet monkeys, they have three different calls depending upon the type of predator that's been seen. If they see an eagle, they have one call. And when, they, when one of the bird monkeys makes a call, the other ones repeat the call, and they will descend down out of the trees, right? Because the eagles come out of the trees, would you know, pick them up from out of the trees. They have a different call, though, if they see like a leopard right, that's on the ground. In that case, they climb up into the tops of the trees, into, you know, to, the, to the farthest twigs. Uh, and obviously, if you know, if they see an eagle, they can't do that. So the, the, the call for the leopard has to be a different one that tells them to go up into the trees instead of going down to the ground. And then they have a third call if they see a snake. If they see a snake, they'll, they'll go up, uh, they'll be up in the trees a little bit, and they'll be sort of scanning the ground, you know, watching for the snake. So they have three different calls that match up to three different types of predators that are important to them. And so this, this has been an indication, oh, this is, this is an example of animal language. And what Deacon indicates is that this is clearly an example of an indexical type of sign in which this, the, you know, each call corresponds to a very specific predator. And it depends upon this kind of correspondence, in fact, between the, 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 the call itself or hearing the call and the presence of that predator. Right? So there has to be that factual correspondence between the sign and the presence of the predator. And what he also indicates is that if, for instance, you know, eagles were to sort of disappear from that particular environment, 
that call would presumably disappear as well because there would no longer be this constant reinforcement <coughs> of the indexical connection which depends upon this correspondence in fact. Right, so if then animal calls are basically a form of index, then they, they will always have to be linked up through that constant reinforcement of the experience of the call being accompanied by that particular experience by, of, of, the, of the eagle or the leopards or the snakes. And so in addition, if one of those calls were to disappear, it doesn't affect the other calls. They're all independent of each other. So that if the eagles disappear and the eagle calls uh, disappear, that doesn't mean that there's going to be some effect on the, on, the, on the snake call or the leopard call. Those will be linked to that specific presence of leopards or snakes in the environment and won't be affected by the disappearance of that other call. So they're, they're each, each um, sign connection is independent of the other sign connection. So they're, you know, they're, they're, they can be considered as sort of isolated signs that don't depend upon relationships to other signs, right? And so this is basically, his argument here then is that all animal communication falls into this category of index or, or of, of likeness as we, as we talked about before, right? And not of, of symbol. So in working out this uh, dependence of animal communication on both icon, what he calls icon, we called likeness before, on icon and index, he's, he gives us another sort of interpretation of how icon, index, and symbol relate to each other. So the first thing he, that he indicates is that icon uh, is based on this quality of recognition, of recognizing one thing to be that thing, which is to say that you recognize this similarity between this one instance and other instances of that thing. And so he's, he's, he focused on this idea of recognition, of recognizing the similarity as the basic type of interpretive move you make with an icon. He also indicates then that index depends upon iconic references, that the, the sort of the, in order to come up with an indexical association, you need to be conscious, conscious of similarities. And I'm going to get to some details of that in a moment, but just, um, just to hold on to that idea that, that the index relationship depends upon uh, a collection of iconic relationships. And then finally, just what, we, uh, what I worked out just in the previous slide with, re with regard to vervet monkey calls, these indexical relationships need to constantly be enforced through this correlation between the sign and an actual factual event in order for that indexical relationship to maintain itself. And finally, these individual indexical relationships, in index, indexes as signs, are independent of other indexes, in indices as signs, right? So uh, as I mentioned just before, you know, the, the, the eagle call uh, is independent of the leopard call and the snake call for the vervet monkeys. So this is a diagram that we have in, uh, in, uh, in Deacon's book, uh, which I think is a, he's got great diagrams, uh, and so I'm <coughs> going to use a couple of them. Uh, in the first one on the, on the left, he's indicating to us the way in which icons are always based on recognizing similarity and linking things to each other through this idea of a similarity or a recognition, right? So the, the, the S is the sign, and then you've got these other objects that are all linked to the sign through this similarity, this, this likeness and recognition. So there's just basically this sort of lack of distinction that's being perceived, right? And so we talked about this before. He, he, he has the example of the, uh, of the moth. We talked about the, uh, the walking stick bug. Same thing going on you, in which you're you're indicate or you're you're recognizing a similarity of quality, and in recognizing the similarity of quality, you're 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 excluding the idea of distinction, in a sense, right? So you you're not distinguishing them; I mean, you're just going to be looking at how two things both participate in the same quality, and therefore are you recognize one as 
the same or, or like the other. So that's the icon. On the right, we have Deacon's depiction of an indexical relationship. And here, what we've got, basically you've got, uh, this is kind of an, uh, similar to the, the, the verbit monkey call. So you've got the sign, so like the, the, the call for the eagle relating to the, the object, which is the, which is the presence of the eagle. And the way this is learned, he's indicating, is through three steps, in a sense, he says, that are all examples of likenesses. And the first thing, the first likeness is that that call has to be seen as like the other calls that have been made in response to the eagle, right? So that the sign has to be seen as like the other instances of that sign, right? So that the call itself has to be similar to past uh, repetitions of that call. Then the object has to be recognized as the eagle being similar to previous examples of the eagle, right? There's a similarity there, right? And then the correlation between the two, so that, that relationship between the sign and the object, the, the, the fact that the previous calls have always been a indication of the previous presence of the eagle, that has to be recognized as a similarity as well. So that this particular time is another repetition of those previous times when the, the call was indicating the presence of the eagle. Right? So there's, there are three types of similarities. Right? Similarity of the signs, similarity of the objects, and then similarity of that connection between the sign and the object to previous cases. Right? And so in, in learning the indexical relationship, the vervet monkeys are learning to match up these three similarities to each other as a kind of group. Right? And that's where the indexical relation comes. Right? And, so, and, and this is also the reason why then the lack of likeness, once the likeness breaks down, if, the, um, if there's no longer a relationship between the call and the eagle, the whole indexical relationship will break, will break down as well, because it's based on the, this relationship of similarity. And the similarity breaks down, the indexical relationship breaks down as well. Right? So in looking at, well, in looking at indexical relationship, he then contrasts index indices to symbols, and he indicates that symbol, hum, human language subordinates these indexical correlations to symbolic relationships, so that the indexical correlations are no longer primary, but the symbolic ones are, in, in, in the sense that, that the relationship of signs to each other become much more important, and the meaning of those indexical relationships then it becomes subordinate to those sign sign relationships and he and you know he's got this <coughs> i'm calling the reason but it's just something he indicates about how reference to impossible things is possible with human signs whereas with these animal calls you couldn't do that there's no way to to reference an impossible thing because you'd have no factual correlation whereas you can do that with human signs because they don't depend upon that factual correlation but depends upon relationships between signs, that relationship between signs can lead to all sorts of different types of representations that don't necessarily have to correspond to anything that actually exists. Right? Um, so what he wants then to indicate then is the way in which this symbolic relationship to objects is determined by rules of combination of symbols with each other and not by the symbol to object relationships. That's, that's, the, key, that's the key move, right? Um, and that this, this probability of co-occurrence is not really important for these symbol-symbol relationships of human language, right? 